Hello and welcome to Nerdphoria. Today I talk about books. Thank you, Miss Shannon, for the suggestion that I talk about books. And first on the bill is one of my all-time favorites, Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451. Uh, Fahrenheit 451 being the temperature at which books burn. Set in a possible future where House, all houses are fireproof, and firemen are charged with burning down houses that contain books, which typically involves the burning the people with it. So a lot of basing on the current time in the 50s when this was published, a lot of focus on, say, the way the Nazi book burnings were, like, a society controlling knowledge for the sake of keeping everyone else stupid. And everyone is pretty stupid in this world. Guy Montag is a simple fireman who doesn't all that much question his job until he meets a curious young lady that lives nearby. Clarice is a very passionate, very spunky teenage girl who has such a passion for telling stories about her family and finding out what's up in Guy's life and everything else and Guy realizes this girl is his he is his friend she's his only friend in a world full of people that don't really even care about well anything and Guy ultimately decides to sneak a few books, decides to read them, and when the chief comes to his house and asks him to get rid of the books, he doesn't, and the rest of the book ensues in a chase. I don't really want to tell you too much more because it's a brilliant book and it's also not very long. Easy day or two read, not a problem. And I just love Bradbury's work in general. He died this year and I was quite saddened by that, but I was impressed with how good of a run that he had. Here, let me explain to you, through a passage in here, what makes this book so great. This is the opening lines. It was a pleasure to burn. Special pleasure to see things eaten, to see things blackened and changed. With the brass nozzle in his fist, with this great python spitting its venomous kerosene upon the world, the blood pounding his head and his hands were the hands of some amazing conductor playing all the symphonies of blazing and burning to bring down the tatters and charcoal ruins of history. His symbolic helmet numbered 451 on his stolid head and his eyes all orange flames at the thought of what came next. He flicked the igniter and the house jumped up in a gorging fire that burned the evening sky red and yellow and black. He strode in a swarm of fireflies. He wanted above all, like the old joke, to shove a marshmallow on a stick in the furnace while the flapping pigeon-winged books died on the porch and lawn of the house, while the books went up in sparkling whirls and blew away on a wind turned dark with burning. Montag grinned the fierce grin of all men singed and driven back by flame. He knew that when he returned to the firehouse, he might wink at himself a minstrel man, burnt corked in the mirror, Later going to sleep, he would feel the fiery smile still gripped by his face muscles in the dark. It never went away, that smile. It never, ever went away as long as he remembered. Obviously, a wonderful metaphor-filled, like, great description of the idea of what it's like to be the man causing that fire. To have such the, such power to bring down worlds, to literally burn down history, which is what happens when you burn books, obviously. And 
I just that line, that passage alone makes book so memorable to me. Okay, and as a more recent thing, a much more recent thing, not to go too far into the fad because I like it, because I like it. It's awesome. I don't care about the hype. I just think it's good. The Hunger Games. Okay, obviously, most people know by now that the Hunger Games follows the story of Katniss, who is comes a tribute in the Hunger Games in the country that was once the United States, known as Panem. Hunger Games details a world where a country is split into 12 districts. Two people, a guy and a girl from each district, get sent into the games and are made to fight for their life. Only one survivor is allowed. But Katniss kind of trumps that, doesn't she? The end. But it turns out that her and Peta are picked for picked to survive together because there's something even worse in store within the confines of Catching Fire and Mocking Jay, which all three are good books. I'm not as fond of this. Some of the descriptions are a little shoddy, but the story itself is great. It flows fast. You keep wanting to read it. Just except for the last book, the ending is a little too rushed. Okay. And of course, I can't talk about Hunger Games without talking about Battle Royale, which, along with The Most Dangerous Game and Lord of the Flies and a few other things, Battle Royale is definitely one of the major influences behind the Hunger Games. Battle Royale is a Japanese novel, um, which was made into, later into a film, as well as a manga, of the same name, by Kaushun Takami. Battle Royale it details a story about an experiment, a game, as it were, where a bunch of students are gassed and then thrown onto an island where they will fight to the death. There's a certain amount of time that they must finish this by. They have bombs implanted in something in their body, and there are various weapons th throughout the island in order to which to kill and seriously harm their classmates. I mentioned the fact that, say, Hunger Games, Katniss and Co. are like 16, and some of the other people are younger, but all of the kids in Battle Royale are middle schoolers. Gross, right? It was up with these post-apocalyptic worlds where we have children kill each other for some reason. I don't know. Either way, Battle Royale is a much grittier, much bloodier, much more... Oh my god. Than even The Hunger Games is. The movie, while not as good as the book, was quite a lot of fun. If I can feel okay to say fun in that context. Interesting, to say the least. I had only hoped that this guy would write a sequel to this book because it is great. Even shows you a map and the front cover that shows the forbidden zones between what t which times certain places are forbidden to be in or else you blow up all that good stuff where the supplies are whatever they're a little more well equipped than some people in the hunger games let's say that much um they also do a call in every morning saying how many people have died and how many people are left that kind of thing just like in the hunger games um don't want to say too much, but like in The Hunger Games, the ending is not as grim as you would expect it to be. 
It also comes as parts of the ending come as kind of a shock. Just like they do in the last two books of the Hunger Games. Okay. Two more things for you. Well, yeah. Okay. One of my favorite sci-fi series ever. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Which I have bound in this awesome volume. Which has all five books. Plus the short story, Young Zaphod Plays It Safe. Okay. Arthur Dent is a poor earth man in England who really has such a boring and dumb life well according to his friend the fruity and awesome Ford prefect who is actually an alien who took his earth name from a very unpopular car which did not last very long on the market at all It turns out that Arthur Dent wakes up one morning and his house is going to be bulldozed over. In order to make way for a high speed bypass. Which Arthur is not aware of and is told that the records have been available to see down at a city hall or something of the like. Which is crazy because no one had ever told him or asked him if it was okay to build a bypass through his house. He did not agree to that. Nor did he agree to the Vogon constructor fleet high above the Earth that is destroying their planet to construct a hyperspace bypass through where this planet is, or their planet is in the way. Vogon said that this has been on record in blah 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 for so long, you stupid humans, you had time to take care of this, but now it's too late. Of course we didn't know. We don't even know about interstellar travel or anything, you know? It's like, nothing. Okay, so Ford finds his friend Arthur lying in front of a bulldozer, and he's like, come on, the world's ending. My house is going away, and Ford's just like, dude, the world's ending, get over it. Okay, so obviously Ford takes Arthur down to the bar, they have a few drinks, he tells him about what's happening. They hitch a ride on the Vogan Constructor fleet, and after putting up with the horrible poetry of the Vogans, are later thrown out of an airlock, and in a very improbable manner are picked up by the Heart of Gold, the only ship running on the Ultimate Improbability Drive, where they run into Ford's old friend and President of the Galaxy, as well as wanted criminal, Zephod Beeblebrox. The man with two heads. He's kind of awesome and he's kind of horrible. As well as Marvin the Paranoid Android and Trillian, who is a girl that Arthur tried to woo unsuccessfully. All five books are really amazing. I don't like the fifth one as much, nor do I like the sixth one, which was not written by Douglas Adams and therefore is not part of my review here. And another thing by Oyen Colfer. It's a great book, but it doesn't have quite the magic that Douglas Adams had, obviously. Um, I don't want to give too much away because Hitchhiker's Guide is incredible if you have not read it. Full of comedy and sci-fi and explosions and weird love triangles and aliens and depressing robots and universes ending, parallel universes, multiple realities. What really happened to Elvis? Where we actually come from? And, of course, the ultimate answer to the ultimate question, 42. Okay, last but not least, I will talk about Harry Potter. Harry Potter is one of my all-time favorite series. It's probably one of the things I have reread more than anything else. I don't reread books much, but 
Harry Potter, I can't resist rereading because it's just as magical and just as awesome. I don't reread the first three nearly as much just because there's not as much going on. There's a lot less that I forget. Um, book four is really where Harry Potter t makes a turning point into more adult territory. More serious, more deadly, more frightening and horrendous when he sees Voldemort face to face in his real body. And then there's Order of the Phoenix, wherein Harry meets Dolores Umbridge, who is not even not in league with Voldemort at all, but just misguided, naive, and completely evil in the standard run of the mill politician way. Not like, oh my god, I am purposely making but either way, she does a bunch of stuff in the name of good. And it doesn't work out. And speaking of the greater good, we find that Dumbledore has also done th bad things for the greater good in his life, such as knowing Harry is bound to be the sacrifice at the end of the final book. And speaking of... The last two books are, in fact, my favorite books, Half-Blood Prince and The Deathly Hallows. The thing was, Snape killing Dumbledore was such a shocker. It was like, I never liked Snape. He was an ass. He was a jerk. But I didn't expect that. And I was like, is there something more to this? And I was like, no, it's too obvious that there'd be something more to this. And that's what was great. Because when we find out the true story at the end of Deathly Hallows, the only book to not take place mostly at Hogwarts, I might add, whereas Half-Blood Prince is the only book to take place pretty much 90% at Hogwarts. That's very odd. Um, but yeah, that we find the true story where he told Voldemort, he told Dumbledore, I mean. Snape told Snape was told by Dumbledore to off him and make it look like so he wouldn't have to break his unbreakable vow and to prove his loyalty to Voldemort. So Snape, a perfect double agent till the end who meets a very grisly and very dramatic end. Especially in the movie, the thumping and ugh, no. But J.K. Rowling has inspired a generation of readers, generations of readers, I might add. And how many people these days can boast that? Sure, we've had the Twilights, and we've had the Hunger Games, and we've had the Harry Potters, and we've had the... Like, I Am Number Four, and all these other like things that are meant for, like the tweens and the teens and the whoever else to read and nothing truly captures the magic of Harry Potter not even the Hunger Games doesn't even come close really to be honest but none of this stuff is as special to me or as special to the future as Harry Potter thanks a lot Joe you have done a lot of things your characters are amazing, and I cannot wait to read your first adult book, which comes out next month. Is that correct? Okay. Anyway, this has been a fairly long episode, and I could talk about Harry Potter all day, but maybe we'll have a special Harry Potter-themed episode in the future. If you would like that, please comment. Or comment anyway, because I want to know what you want to do. Thank you very much. And Shannon, I hope that this was nice for you.